So recall that I talked about triglycerides being formed from a glycerol moiety, and moiety is just a fancy chemical word that means that part of a molecule or that section of a molecule. So when we have a big complicated molecule, as you've seen, we tend to break it into groups, and those groups are called moieties. It's a French word. It means uh, half or part. The glycerol moiety has taken on three fatty acid tails through a process of dehydration synthesis in each case. And this is uh, showing an example of a glycerol molecule with three fatty acid tails on it. And so we're going to call that a triglyceride. Here's a couple examples of a triglyceride. One is a fully saturated triglyceride. Uh, it comes from palm oil, and so it's called palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is an example of a triglyceride that's made up completely of saturated fatty acids. Notice we have nothing in the tails except for CH2 groups. CH2, CH2, CH2 over and over again, finally ending up in a CH3, all of which is nonpolar, has no oxygen atoms, no nitrogen atoms, no sulfur atoms, so there's no opportunity for any of this to interact with water molecules. This is a water-hating or hydrophobic portion of the molecule. An example of a polyunsaturated fatty acid is linoleic acid. When we add linoleic acid with its three kinks in it, formed by the three double bonds, then we end up with the tails, the lipid tails of the triglyceride repelling each other, pushing each other apart. When we put these together into cell membranes, for example, we're going to see that these kinky tails push each other apart and make the membrane more fluid. When we want to regulate the fluidity of the cell membrane, as we'll see in Module 4, then we do that by including phospholipid molecules, which have more or fewer kinks in them. If we have more kinks, in other words, if we have a polyunsaturated fatty acid tail, then that tends to be more fluid. If we have fewer kinks, then it packs closer together. And so that's what happens when we add saturated fatty acids onto the phospholipid molecules that we'll see later on form cell membrane. Well, triglycerides are a storage form of lipid and also the form in which some lipids are moved around in the blood. But inside of cells, the main lipid constituents are what are called phospholipids. They want to have a polar head group that can interact either with the inside of the cell which is mostly water, or with the outside of the cell, which is mostly water. And then we want phospholipid tail groups, hydrophobic tail groups, which are going to interact only with each other. As we'll see in Module 4, this helps the cell membrane assemble itself without any help from enzymes or, or other uh, helpers that are needed to put this together. This will self-assemble. So these hydrophobic tails, as we expect, consist of nothing but carbon and hydrogen atoms. So we have two fatty acid molecules on a phospholipid. We have the glycerol, which holds them together. But in this case, the third carbon of the glycerol is attached to the hydrophilic head, uh, which has a phosphate functional group. And then in this particular case, there's a choline group. We don't necessarily need to know the structure of choline, but it should be obvious to you that we're going to call this phospholipid phosphatidylcholine for that reason, because of the choline group that's in there. This choline group, along with the phosphate, really loves water, so this is the part of the molecule that's going to interact with the watery part of the cell inside the cell and the watery parts outside the cell. So we call a molecule which does this amphipathic. In other words, its emotions or pathos can go either way. It can have a part of the molecule that loves water. It can have a part of the molecule that hates water. So we see at the top of this diagram the part of the molecule that loves water. We see at the bottom the parts that hate water. Well, as we'll see in Module 4 in some detail, this structure allows for phospholipid molecules to self-assemble 
into what's called a lipid bilayer with a hydrophobic interior excluding water entirely, so no water in this region, and a hydrophilic exterior interacting with either the outside of the cell or the cytoplasm, the watery substances inside the cell. Another example of a lipid molecule is cholesterol. Cholesterol is important by itself, but it's also important for the synthesis of many other lipids. When we look at hormones in Module 14, we'll see that many hormones are made from the cholesterol molecule. We see three examples of those here. Testosterone, which is one of the male sex hormones. Cortisol, which is made by the adrenal cortex, the glands on top of the kidneys. Estradiol, which is an important female hormone. And then cholesterol is also used to make lipid-soluble vitamins or fat-soluble vitamins such as vitamin D. Lipids can be important signaling molecules. The signaling molecules shown here are icosanoids, the prostaglandins, and the leukotrienes. We won't learn much about them in this course, but in human medicine, they're very important for regulating the process of inflammation when the, the body mounts a defense against a perceived invader. So prostaglandins and leukotrienes are going to be an important set of mediators that regulate the process of a nonspecific immune defense or inflammation. Also in the category of miscellaneous lipids are the fat-soluble vitamins. The fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, which we showed earlier, E, and K. Each of these has a role. Lipoproteins are examples of lipids. As I said earlier, this is where lipids are in collaboration with proteins so that they can be carried easily in the blood and can be managed by all the different cells. Lipoproteins come in different amounts of lipid content from high to low. They're very low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, and high density lipoprotein. Now the way that I remember this is that if I make chicken soup and I put it in the refrigerator, the fat is going to rise to the top. If I make gravy, the fat rises to the top. So I know that lipid has a lower density than water does. So the more protein that's in it, and proteins generally like to hang out with water, the more protein that's in it, the higher density it's going to have. The more lipid that's in it, the lower the density is going to be. So the lipid content of VLDL, or very low density lipoprotein, is very high. The protein content of high density lipoprotein, or HDL, is relatively high. We also believe that, that the more lipid content that these lipoproteins have, the worse the health effects are. So VLDL is thought to have very bad health effects, or more to the point, people with high VLDL levels tend to have a propensity for heart disease, we believe, and people with more HDL or higher proportion of high-density lipoprotein, or HDL, uh, tend to have less heart disease, we believe. I'm not that certain of those facts myself, but that's certainly the conventional wisdom at the point at which I make this recording.